Thanks so much, okay. Okay, just before starting, how many of you would know more or less what a blockchain is? Okay, fantastic. So then I would propose to keep the talk somehow short so we have more time to discussion like 20, maybe 20 minutes something like that or or i can talk f deeper into the topics that you are most interested it's just that the project is incredibly broad and i would prefer interaction with you to know which parts do you want to get into it sounds good so i will uh, skip all introduction to the blockchain <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> basically <laughs> okay that's cool so thanks a lot for inviting me I will uh, give for granted that you know more or less what the collaborative economy is. So when we talk about collaborative economy, we hear about Airbnb, we hear about Uber. We can also uh, talk about the classical peer production models like open source software communities or Wikipedia or even crowdfunding uh, platforms like Kickstarter. So it would be beyond sharing economy. It would be a wider umbrella concept let's say this field of course it's growing exponentially and more and more industries are uh, being platformized somehow or or uh, are getting into the idea of using communities for either sharing resources or allowing the people to collaborate with a platform mediated by a pl an online platform in order to create resources like in Wikipedia or share resources like in Airbnb. So in this context, we have what I see as three main challenges in the field. In practice, we have huge, in, uh, typically corporations, it's the most typical uh, organizational form that build a platform that have to maintain this platform dealing with hundreds of thousands or even millions of users and just the maintenance of the system it's insane because we are dealing just with keeping the software updated or scaling the services and the hardware for being provisioning service that we are talking about millions and millions typically right so it's trying to provide a community of users larger than many countries. And we are not talking about Facebook, that it would be a, the order of billion. It, so just the maintenance, it's incredibly costly. So they are, if they, regardless if they are for profit or not, they are strongly pushed to monetize their, their users. And the typical form that we know that they monetize their users is what, whatever they have, that it's their data. So basically, Surveillance is the business model of the internet today. It's taking benefit of the user's data, trying to uh, uh, compute and deduct as much as you can from the user data in order to have a business model for advertisers. This is the most common business model today. Uh, and this is inherent to these huge centralized platforms that rely on their centralized infrastructure where the, there is a sole infrastructure owner that has to maintain the service. There is, it's, it's very structural to their, I mean, it, it's the most common scenario all the time, right? This situation basically uh, creates a situation in which there is a difference of power between those that control the infrastructure, these infrastructure owners, and the communities of users doesn't matter how many scandals the infrastructure owners suffer, the users have no saying in how the platform evolves. doesn't matter how much we criticize Uber, Uber continues uh, driving a platform in their own interest, because it's normal, it's a corporation, they are designed like that, right? It's, it, I mean, they want to m maximize profit in order to keep the service sustainable, running. It's but at the same time, they, these users are the ones that are interacting, creating value, but they have very little influence in how this evolves. So there's a, a, a strong inequality in the governance of these communities. And in the same way, this, uh, because of this difference of power, 
all economic profit is again concentrated in the infrastructure owners. It's not distributed among the users that are the ones that create value in the end. So either the users do not receive any profit, economic profit, or just receive a bit like, for example, some YouTube, YouTube users would receive some rewards and stuff like that. So the research question of this project is, can we create platforms in another way? Can we create platforms where the infrastructure is decentralized? So there is no one sole owner of the infrastructure. Where the governance is democratic. So the communities do have a saying in how the platform evolves. And where the profit is distributed among the users. Which in the current scenarios is not happening. So in order to deal with these three challenges, I propose to use the blockchain and its potentials to unleash all this. So this is, uh, as Sergey said, a uh, ERC project for the University of Complutense in Madrid with st strong ties and collaboration with the Bergman Klein Center, where I have affiliation and multiple advisors from there will be helping me in the project. And it's a five years project that started l last month, so it's not that we did much. <laughs> uh, but what's the plan? The idea is that instead of relying of, uh, on a centralized, oh, the, the arrows are not very clear. Anyway, so instead of relying on a centralized, oh, fuck, what happened? Instead of relying on a centralized server where we would uh, have the service running, such as an Airbnb or an Uber, right, relying on their centralized infrastructure, we would rely on a blockchain. <coughs> a blockchain can, um, can be like in Bitcoin, um, having the record of transactions, the ledger of the transactions as the the currency exchanges are moving forward, let's say, but can also have code. We can also, I mean, the, in the end, they are storing data in a replicated way in a distributed network. We can also uh, embed code instead of just the history of transactions. So these pieces of code, these snippets of code, are what we call the smart contracts. It's a terrible name, but let's try to use it. Um, the smart contracts come from the metaphor of instead of smartphones, now we have contracts that instead of a legal contract, an agreement between uh, people, we have uh, some code that mediates the interaction or an agreement between two, two people. But it can be much more than that. You can actually uh, encode much more than an agreement between two people. You can, in the end, you can encode rules. Like you can, we have been used to encoding rules in code for a while. When we have Airbnb, we are a community of users interacting mediated by the rules established in the code, established by the platform. The platform al tells you what can you or what can you co not do, right? The, you can't do this because there is a feature that allows you. And the code then is restricting the freedom of the user. It's, it's actually listing the rules that you can or cannot, the, things, the actions that you can or cannot do in the platform. <coughs> the same way, we can have a, I mean, blockchain, let's say, facilitates this process of embedding rules that um, Uh, constrain the user actions in certain manners. So we can very easily imagine, let's say all of us, a group of people, being mediated by the rules of a, a smart contract, of a complex smart contract. We could have a legal uh, organization and a bylaws, right? And we would be mediated by these laws that decide how we organize with each other, how we interact with each other. The same way we could have these values encoded in a smart contract. And this is what we call a decentralized autonomous organization. A group of people mediated by these 
pieces of code that are not relying on a server are in a blockchain. That is that once it's deployed, unless the code says so, it, no one can unplug it. Unless the code says the summer can unplug it. So typically we would see code that is with deployed with a high level of autonomy in order for you to trust the code because if it says summer can modify it whenever you want then for you trusting the code you have to trust me right but if it says the code cannot be modified by summer even if summer deployed it well then you don't need to trust me to trust the code right and you can actually sign the code and interact with the rules of that code because the code will not lie the code will, I mean, if you can see the code, you can know what will happen in each of the scenarios. So if we have DAOs, if we have DAOs, centralized autonomous organizations, this could be a good way of dealing with the first problem. So instead of having a centralized infrastructure that is very costly and that relies on a single infrastructure owner, we could have an ecosystem of DAOs, where multiple people deploy their own DAO and they can interoperate with each other and the rules of the system are in the blockchain. Today DAOs or DAOs are built directly on top of Ethereum. Ethereum is a distributed computing platform, let's say. Basically tries to abstract the, the complexities of the blockchain providing a programming language for us to build the smart contracts on top of it. I will not get into the details, but today building DAOs is a hell. It's really complex. It's like writing assembler, but while you are programming a nuclear reactor. It's really, really an issue, and whatever bug happens, it's not like in a web uh, web service that, well, I fix, I deploy it and I will fix it later. No, it can actually have disastrous consequences. I can get into that later if you're interested. Um, so what the project is going to do is provide some tools, a framework for deploying, for building DAOs better. Which type of DAOs? Color, DAOs for the colorative economy. Those with aims of people will, will, uh, where people will collaborate with each other in some manner. How we will do that? We will follow a very modular approach where we will build modules or Legos with features that people can com de developers or researchers can combine different modules and deploy their service. So if we are, for example, building a decentralized Airbnb, for continuing with the same example, we would need a module with a marketplace. We would need a module of re for reputation. We would uh, need a module maybe for some social networking features. We should combine them and deploy it. And if some, mod some features are missing, then I should write my own module, add it to the repository, so others can reuse it. <coughs> Talking about the second challenge, we can follow the same approach. So we could create modules for multiple governance models. We can embed governance rules, ways of decision making in different modules. So when you, I am deploying my decentralized Airbnb, I can pick the governance model that fits better the platform that I want to build. So for example, we know that, you all know Wikipedia, Wikipedia, I, the, its community is managed in a democratic way. Classical representative democratic, democracy, like with voting, elections that are periodical, representatives, these representatives elect other representatives, and so on. We could perfectly embed that in uh, as a governance model. But on inst in Stack Overflow, for example, we have a reputation mechanism going on as a governance model, where only those that have higher reputation, they can perform further actions. So the more 
reputation you have, the more permissions you have, and then you, you have more administrative privileges, and, and you have more power, basically, in the system. There is also approaches like platform cooperativism, the le trying to learn from cooperatives in order to embed those uh, principles into platforms. So we will experiment with different governance models and see and allow a full spectrum of repository of uh, options for those that want to build their own platform. And similarly, we can do something equivalent with economic models. So we could have a repository of modules that embed economic models. S we can easily imagine something like Patreon, where kind of um, periodical crowdfunding method, where people that are um, following a certain artist can have a recurrent payment in order to get some of their uh, the privileges of, of, of some uh, art ahead, like video making or there are comics or musicians that are f using that platform. But we can easily imagine other methods like where an uploader receives a payment, a micropayment, and a downloader has to perform a micropayment. I mean, the blockchain, because of these token tokenization mechanisms, because of these cryptocurrencies that are so on the hype today, allow the transfer of value in a very easy manner. It's much easier than if you want to transfer money automatically with a software, you have to deal with, uh, with banks. And this typically, in, um, I don't know if you have tried, but it's quite a trouble to do it automatically. Here, you are bypassing the, as we all know, the bank uh, middleman. So we have a framework, we have a set of models. We will use simulation to, before deploying certain models that might be uh, sensible in certain communities. For example, if we deploy today a reputation mechanism on Wikipedia, or certain rewards, for example, paying money for Wikipedia contributions, we might actually destroy the community. Because w uh, today, people are collaborating with each other, but if we create a dynamic in which they have to compete for the reward, they might stop collaborating, and the community might collapse. In certain contexts, competition can be positive. In other contexts, it can be incredibly destructive. So let's simulate it, see how it behaves in a lab experiment before deploying it in the real world. The same way, this is an interdisciplinary project, so we will use social research to understand and analyze the whole spectrum of governance and economic models that are out there, both already deployed or in the literature, to see which models we want to experiment with. At the same time, we would like to know which actual needs have today's collaborative economy platforms in order to build features that are grounded in real needs, not on just what we have in our heads. In this line, as the best way to validate a framework is with real users and real pilots and real examples, we will, use, we will actually build pilots of real use cases. So we will partner with existing communities and perform pilots with them using these modules. Um, like combining modules or defining them, this designing the modules that they need in order to deploy the pilots either on governance or in economic uh, models. We have already so, uh, spoken with some communities. Amara is the largest community of s people doing collaboratively subtitles, for example. Others have approached to us and we are we have to do a selection of the communities that we we will choose as pilots. S we will also build a test bed for researchers and developers to train, to test their models. So 
I, we can do actual experimentation. Experimentation of which kind of questions? So for example, we would be interested, what are the limits of purely technical governance? This, now that we can do DAOs where all the, our, the decision making can be encoded, all the ways that we interact can be encoded, do we want that? Or to which extent do we want to be governed by code, like in Bitcoin? Or we want some users to have some control over what's going on? Some committees, some voting. What are the limits of that? How autonomous these organizations could be? At the same time, we will uh, experiment with incentives. On one hand, we believe that incentives could be make these communities more productive. On the other hand, as I said before, incentives could disrupt the collaborative dynamics of these communities. So we have to see which kind of incentives and in which way, and how economic models affect the governance and vice versa. So overall, what we are trying to build here is a new generation collaborative economy that instead of relying on centralized, uh, strongly concentrated governance and profit, we would have a collaborative economy in which the infrastructure is decentralized, the governance is democratic, and the profit is distributed. So instead of trying to build, trying to compete with the current monopolies that are existing in the collaborative economy today, because in practice, Facebook is a monopoly, Google is a monopoly, I mean, GitHub is a monopoly. You can call them pseudo-monopolies if you want, but the internet centralized infrastructure today creates a win winner-takes-all market continuously, like the first one takes everything. Instead of trying to compete with that, which is very difficult in the current situa situation because there is a lock-in situation in which the users are locked in inside these walled gardens, we can change the rules of the game. We can create an ecosystem in which uh, when I deploy a service, it's very easy for the user to move to a different service. So, and, and, and this, this platform has much less capacity to do locking of their users. Basically because they are not the sole controllers of the infrastructure. Because anyone can fork the software and create another version. Because the, the user identities are shared across the same blockchain between services. Bec maybe even listings of housing can be shared with, uh, across multiple Airbnbs. So then there would be much more competition and much less entry, cost uh, of entry in, in every market. And that's it. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed it and I'm looking forward to the questions. By the backend, so you have a um, backend and a frontend. The frontend is interacting with the users. The backend is interacting with the. Yes, like the idea is that Ethereum in the end is providing you backend, but we are extending that in order to facilitate the work of developers. Today, it's really an issue to build DAOs. Not talking about the front end dealing with the, us the users. It's the back end rules that are really problematic. You mean by the, the web, web 3 JS, the whole You mean by the <coughs> web 3 I mean, JS? I, I'm talking in the end of sol the solidity contract. The, the actual uh, code that is running on the, con on the blockchain. Today, it's we have seen examples like uh, the DAO or parity collapses, which is really problematic. If we followed approaches that are, m instead of wa trying to de build my, o my whole thing, let's break it down. Let's break it down in components. Let's follow the classical Unix approach. We take modules, we validate these modules, we make sure that the each module works, 
and we combine modules that are validated and replicated and we know that they work. Okay, but uh, with the parity and with the DAO, it's pure human error. Like, there's nothing sure. wrong with the code. How do you plan to break the whole, you plan to break the whole Ethereum code into something new or? No, I will not get, I will build on top of Ethereum. So uh, it will be wrapped around by Ethereum. Kind of the thing, I mean, we will try to be agnostic towards the platform just in case tomorrow Ethereum, I mean, the, 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 the field is evolving too rapidly, right? And yep. this is a five years project. We don't know if Ethereum will be the dominant smart contract platform or the most suitable for our needs in three years, but mostly. But as long as you, the platform compiles solidity, it's fine. We will try to have a package manager to deal with the different modules so we can abstract to a certain extent the dependency of Ethereum. Today, in practice, there is no alternative to Ethereum. So we will run but that. Because I, I cannot see how can you, after you upload any smart contract, you cannot change anyway. So I mean, you can change things. The thing, you cannot change that. Is, I mean, you can change the pointer to the most updated version of the smart contract, okay. right? So you yeah. can append, even if it's append only, you can be uh, adding new versions of the code and the pointer be changing. So for the user it's transparent and it's updated. Okay, that way, yes. Can you can you expand what do you think are the main limitations of solidity and why do you think they need to be changed? Me. So are you familiar with the DAO disaster? No. Okay, who's familiar with that? Uh, I don't know if any of you want to. <laughs> so basically, trying to be brief, um, one enterprise wants to build a hedge fund, basically, where you put money into the uh, hedge fund and you can decide where the money is invested, right? And they do an ICO. Uh, yeah, ICO, everyone, or less, yeah. But the, uh, what you are, it's money that theoretically you can recover as any hedge fund, you put money, but you can recover the money, right? The money is just an investment that you can pull back. So the rules allow the people to, in, to recover the money if the data is invested. So this creates an incredible explosion of people trying to invest money there. And for increasing com um, confusion in the field, they call it the DAO. So it's a DAO and they call it the DAO as if it is the only one. I mean, it's just a publicity stunt, but it works for them as if it's the only DAO anyway. So, I mean, whatever, the thing is that they attract, I don't remember exactly the figures, uh, $150 million, which is a lot. So this is all money that is relying, on, and the, the point was everything is controlled by this DAO. Everything is controlled by these rules in the smart contract. We are not controlling it. You are not giving it to us. You are controlling it. You, you, the, the, the software is controlling everything, right? <coughs> so suddenly this software has $150 million in tokens of Ether, in Ethereum, and, they, and there is a bug. So someone takes, with, which we don't know who, but doesn't matter, takes benefit of that bug and steals $50 million. Because of the rules of that, it was not automatic stealing. You had to, well, I will not get into the details, but basically they did a child of the, this DAO. Uh, but because of the rules of the DAO that they, cannot, this, they couldn't be skipped, you had to wait, I think, 28 days in order to get the money and being able to transfer it to a, any other uh, wallet. So the... Um, so basically the community had 28 days to know what to do. Because in the moment that 
someone takes it and just begins spending money and whatever, then the money is distributed and then it's very difficult to do something with it. As long as it's concentrated, you can do something. What's the only way, way to solve this? Well, actually, to, to, to do something that theoretically you cannot do, to change the blockchain, mm -hmm. right? To f do a hard fork, move back the, the time <laughs> in, the, in the blockchain, go back in time, ignore the last things that happened, like discard the last blocks that were added, and say, and fix the DAO, and then g continue. So they did a voting in the Ethereum, I mean, Ethereum called the Vitalik, that is the founder of Ethereum, called for a vote. People voted, the majority, the far majority uh, supported the idea of the hard fork because also so many people had lost money there. And they did it. Problem, well, multiple problems. The community was divided. People were angry with this. Many people were angry with the decision. Even if it was voted, some people said that it was decided in a rush, that not so many people had were able to vote in the, mom in the window of, I think, 24 hours, or something like that, that you could vote, or maybe a bit more, but around that. So, uh, so that people decided, no, 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 no. Ethereum should continue. I mean, the blockchain, I mean, what you sold us is that the blockchain will not be changed. So if the blockchain is not changed, I'm sorry, there is a bug, the code is low, the code rules, you lose your money. Mm -hmm. There was a risk when you put your money and you assume the risk. So then today we have two versions of Ethereum. Ethereum Classic, which is an alternative reality in which the hacker took the 50 million. And Ethereum, that kept the brand name, where that didn't happen. And both blockchains are being mined, and both, blo blo both blockchains have Ether, and you can have Ethereum Classic Ether or, Ether or Ethereum Ether. And in, what, in one reality, the hack happened. In the other one, it didn't. <coughs> this is insane, if you think so, about it. Sorry, what happened with the money? <laughs> so in which reality? In the reality no, no, no. that... <laughs> there is only one reality in real money. <laughs> so in Ethereum Classic... In Ethereum Classic, the hacker can use this Ether, but it's Ether Classic. In Ethereum with Ether, normal Ether, uh, the hacker could not use this Ether. So, uh, and Ether Classic is another cryptocurrency that is in the market, that has its a, a value. It's lower than the Ethereum, the Ether, the legitimate whatever Ether. But, uh, but it has value, so the hacker could go out with that money. I actually don't know if they, the guy is actually spent that money or, or it's still dead in a wallet, but you could go to the blockchain and check because the identity, everything is public, everything is transparent in a blockchain. So, so, so value was divided. Right. Actually, yeah. that's very funny because it was not. When ha both Bitcoin and, and Ethereum has suffered forks, and the value of the currency of both Bitcoin and Ethereum continued going up, while the fork had value in its own. So basically, we created value, <laughs> but as the whole thing is a bubble, it's not that it depends on logic anymore. <laughs> okay. But okay, so... Okay, uh, there, there is another story that I can... Anyway, go on. Oh, go ahead, tell the story. <laughs> <laughs> At that time, it was three euros per Ethereum. So when they split, you get 15 million of the Ethereum. But now, now. 30 euros of the Ethereum classic. So that's 10 times. Yeah. Uh, if he gets 500. If he, okay. if, if he didn't spend it, yeah. so we don't know what happened. Uh, I mean... I don't know what's wrong with with all the with everything that you said. 
I mean, basically, if you if you if you are if you if the proposal is that code is law, code is law. Sure. Actually, the hackers didn't do anything wrong. No, no, no. I'm, everything I'm they did was perfect. I'm not saying that the hackers did anything wrong. I am just saying that the DAO proposers, because they had to it's deal with up. the com huge complexities ah, okay. of this. Okay. They wouldn't want that to happen. I mean, they had several audits, and no one detected that bug. Well, it's not true. Some people detected the bug, and they did, but this is another story. But at least from their perspective, there was nothing wrong with the code. It's very fair. I mean, OK, if it's that complicated to deploy that, people will not do it. OK, let's facilitate that people do it. Let's do it in another way. Let's, le le let's work it out, and the best I mean, you cannot change that it's very difficult to deploy things on the blockchain. Let me put you another example. So Parity is um, a company, if you want to say, it's a company that is collaborating in the, uh, with Ethereum, let's say, to extend some features of the system, OK? So Ethereum wanted to dis decentralize the, <coughs> the development. So they are not the only one developing features for the platform. So Parity. Um, did a um, multi-sig, how do I explain that? Yeah, multi-sig? Yeah. Everyone is... So in a, in a wallet, if, if three, people, three of us want to put money in a wallet, but we would say, no, no, we want at least two people to agree in order to take money from it, not just any of the three to get it, right? Which happens all the time in any organization that wants to have money. All the time, right? Mm -hmm. So the multi-sig feature was developed by Parity, that they are super experts in Ethereum, right? Um, and used across the ecosystem by so many people. Well, it had a bug, as any complex software has. Like, I mean, it's normal that complex software has bugs. We know that. It's, it's impossible not to have bugs in any complex thing that we do. The problem is that if you deploy it in a web service, it only affects that web service. If you deploy it in a blockchain and people use that, then we have an issue because it's an infrastructure layer. And then we had um, someone detected the bug, a black hat detected the bu bug, and started stealing money from all the multi stick accounts starting with the ones that had most money and going down. Some group of white hat hackers saw what was happening. The guy had already stolen, I think, 200 million. Uh, so they decided, OK, what's the only way of solving this? Stealing ourselves all the money of all the ecosystem that is using multisec. So the hacker doesn't do it. They stole all the money and after slowly returned it to their original uh, owners. So let's put it in, in terms of the physical world. So one thief finds a bug in one bank. This bug allows him to steal any bank. And the only solution is to, for the good guys is to steal all the banks of the world in order for the thief not to steal it. I mean, it's completely insane, this way of doing things. It's not that you can send a patch and that's it. No, it's not, it's not that way. It's really, it's really much more like a nuclear reactor than with, like a web service. It's really very problematic. Because this thing that once deployed, you cannot change it. It affects many people in the parallel. It's, it's very slow to update. <laughs> It has certain features that make it marvelous and certain features that make it a hell, so. Besides, th there is a problem that uh, in real world, when you are exploiting a bug of a bank, then you are doing something illegal and you can be prosecuted. <laughs> yeah, while in this, in this world, this is a feature. This is something <laughs> that is allowed and everybody thinks that is good because otherwise you are compromising the very good properties of the system, That's true. which are that this is not going, this is immutable, and once you have inserted something in the blockchain, it's going to. So it's, a, it's, a crit is 
very critical and and also uh, I think you are you are moving uh, in the in the physical classical world you are putting trust in people and here you are putting trust in a, in an infrastructure yep. that totally. uh, maybe it is uh, by now much less tested than the real world entities in which we are now trusting sure. That's why when people tell me, oh, I have this idea for a blockchain, because everybody w wants to put a blockchain in whatever they have, right? So I have this idea, I want to do this, and in six months, one year time, one million people will be using, will be using it. I tell them, don't do that. Don't do that. You can have, blockchain is great to attract money from investors. It's great for experimentation, for research. It's fantastic for research. It's fantastic for doing pilots and prototypes. But today, large scale real world applications do not exist. And it's do not exist because it's very young, the field. It's very, very early. So it's great for researchers. But for real world applications, I mean, if people are telling, no, oh, this, we have this working with, no, it's false. They don't have it working. They have it a prototype, they don't have a large scale service because there is no large scale service in there. I mean, we know that cryptocurrencies work. They do work. Bit Bitcoin, there is a huge incentive for cracking it and it still has not been cracked after 10 years. Okay. Well, nine years. It It is working. The, crypto the cryptography of Bitcoin is hard enough that works and since many cryptocurrencies are basically mimicking Bitcoin, we know that cryptocurrencies work. Ethereum is still beta. It's still full of bugs. It's still not, we cannot, comp we cannot say that we are, are providing the same service as Amazon does. We don't. But it's normal. I mean, the beginning of the internet was the same, right? Yeah, I have a, a different question. You have not talked about energy and I think that that is a concern that is behind all these all these efforts because uh, I think it, this would be nice <coughs> if all the the things that you are providing for granted, such as the in the um, uh, blockchain infrastructure and so on, were working for free. But that's not the case. <coughs> I don't know how this is because it is very nice to be democratic and collaborative and so on, but at the same time, uh, causing a harm to the, I think to the, I, for me, to the ecosystem, it to is not finance. clear for me, all this stuff. Uh, sure. So I think this is a non-issue anymore. I mean, it's not that I'm not worried by environment. I am a lot, <laughs> but, uh, we already have better systems and proof of work and they work. And in fact, Ethereum has already started the transition to proof of stake. In the current network, I think one out of, I don't remember how many, maybe one out of thousand uh, uh, mining, it's, all, it's, it's done not with proof of work, but with proof of stake. Proof of stake does not harm the planet. It does not depend on computation, uh, on constantly having our machines working in order to compete for taking, for mining that next block, which is what is harming the planet. So we already have, I'm not talking about Bitcoin, but the blockchain ecosystem, we already have working solutions. There are already um, cryptocurrencies out there that are like that, like, uh, Peercoin or Faircoin today, they use proof of stake. They don't, well, they use actually do use proof of cooperation now, but it doesn't matter. So, uh, well, Peercoin at least use proof of stake. What? Do you think Peercoin really works? Well, I mean, at least it worked. I mean, it's true that it's not as scalable as the, prop the proposition of Ethereum, but I'm not so worried about that. So, so, so basically, just, just to understand, so you think, you think it's proven that proof of stake works, and I there is a solution that actually I mean, deals I mean, with all the attacks 
nothing at stake at and all that the stuff. the Ethereum propose, I mean, I'm not an expert, okay. but I trust v Vitalik is. Okay. And at least on paper, it's very solid. In the tests that they have been done, it's solid. It's already been implemented in, they wouldn't have rolled it in Ethereum if it was not something that we could start to trust. Although I know that it has <laughs> have its have issues, but uh, I know, I know, I know. But at least in the five years pr uh, of this project, I believe that by the end of it, we will have a s it will be an issue. Yeah. I mean, I'm mo much more worried about other issues like scalability of the like, of the technology than about the environmental issues. Sorry? Have you considered Cardano? What? Cardano. Sorry. It's a, they say it's an Car Ethereum how killer. How do you call it? C. Cardano? Yeah. I don't know that. I mean, I have, I mean, the, the, the ecosystem is, I, I, I can check it out, but I, I honestly don't know about well, it. Well, it's developed by the academia, so they, oh, okay. they claim that they took all the good parts from state of the art and want I to see. pack. I mean, I, I have heard a lot of Ethereum killers that in the end they didn't. Yeah, that's I, I don't know about this one specifically. But Instead of white papers, they actually published peer review papers. Which has a point, that's right? That's what, that's what they claim. <laughs> okay, more questions here from somebody in the back? No? Yeah, l l let me ask so some questions. I, I think uh, uh, you know, your talk was I don't know, quite generic and high level, so it's sure. just... It's it's usually my level, so I like to ask these type of questions and, uh, and also use examples to make the, uh, this high-level question specific. So whenever people criticize something, something, there are two types of complaint. Well, first of all, it's not two types of complaint. Uh, usually it's not possible to do, and there is nothing new here, <laughs> all right? So let me <laughs> uh, kind of elaborate in this context a, a little bit. Mm -hmm. Well, since we started talking about energy constraints, right? Uh, um, and you brought up scalability, uh, right? So th I think th that's one concern that people had about Bitcoin and blockchain technology in general, right? If you distribute computations and storage so much, how feasible it is, and people talk about permission versus, uh, permissionless. And uh, yep. uh, so what's your um, position on, uh, on this? How do, you, uh, how do you see the scalability of this type of like blockchain solutions? I, I think there are many solutions on the table. I don't know which ones are better than others because let's say it's a lower level problem than what I am trying to deal with here. I am in a higher level of abstraction, trusting that the lower level will not collapse, basically. Um, so for example, we could have multiple interoperable blockchains. There are other propositions that, okay, let's uh, after a certain moment, let's uh, summarize all the blockchain till now and continue having blockchain from here. There are others like, okay, we could have um, like the lightning proposal that, uh, okay, if you and me have a lot of uh, transactions to do, let's open a channel of blockchain, do all our transactions and when we end after a certain period of time, we record the result on the blockchain. There are multiple proposals to, to facilitate the scalability of this. I don't know which one will be finally adopted. There is a lot of debate on the ecosystem. I hope we will find a solution, basically. Okay. But I cannot say much more than that. So on the other side, on the kind of the what's new side, uh, the question, uh, and also about organizations, right? <coughs> so when you give A, B, and B, right? So I can personally relate to it, right? Uh, but I, know, I use A, B, and B, but for very simple reason, because they provide affordable housing <laughs> I, I, I can use. So I'm not, I don't know, even though A, B, and B tries to present me as a member of community and I, I know, provide comments when they ask me uh, how I like that place or this place, in all fairness, I'm a customer. I need this space and somebody has the space and I cannot find it otherwise and this are all of the intermediary to mm -hmm. provide, right? And I, uh, if you go to the peer-to-peer -peer 
part of the world, I know I'm I really not interested in doing it. I don't want to provide servers. I don't have to. I want to participate in hiring photographers who take pictures of the apartments to show somebody else. So they, pro they I know they provide. I know they provide the servers, and there is no really, from my point of view, really this huge community that really want to be a part of this business, running this business, and share the uh, Airbnb profits uh, equally. They just want to get the service. So that brings, uh, long introduction brings more specific questions about what's new here in terms of organization. I understand that Airbnb just use technical means to scale their old model. Even the old model you know, without internet were intermediaries who match providers of apartments with those who wanted to render the apartments. Maybe there was bulletin boards and some yeah, wall somewhere, yeah. right? They just managed to, to scale it. At the same time, there was different types of organizations, uh, not necessarily commercial companies, uh, like non-profit, non-for-profit uh, non organizations or uh, cooperatives. Uh, so what do you think the innovation here in terms of type of organizations uh, you can support? Is it the same old kind of things which existed before, there is a really kind of new type of organizations that can unite people? I hope the latter. I hope we can um, have new kinds of organizations, but experimentation will say if they work or not. Basically, I don't know if we will just replicate all the structures or be able to have new types of organization. I am just willing to experiment with them. So, um, so for example, it's very easy to imagine how if you are not just a, a customer on like a renter, but you are renting in Airbnb, there will be like, I have friends that are renting in Airbnb, right? For like the typical renting some room or something like that. And they disagree with some of the policies with um, some of the features of Airbnb. If a different platform could allow them to have a bit more power, like, for example, vote in which features they want, or change to a different, uh, to a different organization, uh, to a different platform that is exactly the same, but without this feature that is they don't like, they would be very happy to do that. It's just that Airbnb holds the power on the reputation. So, so if one user wants to move to another one, has zero reputation, when here you have already accumulated reputation. They also have control over the listings of where, the, where are the houses. So another platform has zero listings. So there is no incentive for a, for a new renter to, to go there. And, and, and they have control over the rules of the interaction, of the, the features of the platform. If we had an ecosystem in which Airbnb only power was the rules and the listings were shared and the users, the user identities were shared, then there would be much more competition on providing different types of rules on different uh, use cases. No, 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 let, let, let me finish. Uh, so for example, some people might say, I want an Airbnb that is anonymous that is fully anonymous, that respects totally my anonymity. Others will say, no, no, I want something that if something goes wrong, there is a strong insurance that protects me. It may be, I may pay a bit more, but the service will provide me, a company will provide an insurance. Others will say, no, no, I prefer local listings, uh, like people from, I don't know, small places and not chains or whatever. And I mean, there would be different um, types of Airbnb for different use cases, and as they are all sharing the same blockchain, they are all sharing the same identities, they can share all the re same reputations, the listings can be on IPFS, that is another technology for distributed storage, that can be shared. So there can be Airbnbs that are working like a co-op, where the people inside kind of mutually support each other, having discounts with each other or whatever, but not doing the same with it, people outside the network, like mutualities, stuff like that. We could experiment with multiple ways of organization and multiple 
types of businesses. Like we could fragment the firm in pieces. The current platforms breaking them in pieces and, prov and, and seeing how this behaves. So your mm, uh, uh, anger <laughs> was... <laughs> no, no, not anger. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so <coughs> basically you, you stated that it is very, very hard and challenging to, to program a proper DAO that it's working fine. I would assume that DAOs will behave essentially the same way that normal organizations. I'm a company, I build this very high performance, well-written code. I won't share anything. It's my development, I will put it out there. I won't share cl clients, I won't share listing, I won't, won't share anything. Why is, there is nothing intrinsic on the blockchain to, to, to incentivize sharing of anything. Sure, it's just that here, if you are, um, if you want to use these modules that I is a lot the development, and I'm making the models interoperable, the, what I'm making much most easy, uh, the, the easiest path to, towards deployment is to deploy a DAO that is interoperable. It's to deploy a DAO that is sharing identities, to deploy a DAO that is just sharing the reputation, it's to deploy a DAO that is relying on, pub on permissionless uh, infrastructure. You can always build things taking part of what I'm providing and putting effort on closing in. Definitely, you can always do that. It's just that today, for a startup to, to start in a, a, a new product, a new platform in the ecosystem, it's very, very difficult to compete. It going to be the same. Well, it's easier in an ecosystem like this to compete because the cost of entry in the market is much easier. It's much lower. And when you are sharing users with others, it's much easier to reach critical mass. But the, the problem is why you should share with others. That is the, the fundamental because I... I I think I understand that the the good chain of the, the good thing of blockchains is that you you can access to some information that was stored there and no one can change it. And I think you are talking a, a about, uh, for example, that could be nice for DAOs. You can, but you say that you can update the the. It, this is like the terms of conditions of any company that. Now you have to trust in the terms of conditions that they are having. Maybe with a DAO, there are some things which you can look at and understand in the code, but there will be a lot of things that are not public and are not playing in this ecosystem. Uh, for example, probably the listings of all the clients, because probably I don't want my my I don't want to participate in in a service in which my personal data is shared with, I don't know why. So sure, there, there are going there to be... There are solutions for that. I mean, I mean, technically there are solutions for that. I mean, but so, so basically you would have a service that is trying not to share things, but it's a new service, and, as, and other services that are sharing. The idea here is that the blockchain allows allows more uh, a higher cooperation than before because basically you just have a medium to co that you don't have to, I mean without trusting a middleman you can cooperate with others you can okay let's put this here and others can use it and I don't need to trust others I mean because the rules are there I mean it's very much it's much easier to cooperate with others it's much easier to share resources with others it's much easier to uh, fragment things and reuse stuff with blockchains so definitely we can have uh, entities that uh, do not share and that, that are less transparent and we can have others that share and are more transparent typically some users would prefer more transparent things than others others may not it's fine uh, the only thing is that here the ecosystem that is sharing will probably advance faster because it's much easier to reach critical mass. It's true that with big investments, you can avoid that. Let's see how the, the ecosystem behaves. I, don't, I cannot predict if we'll, it will behave as the internet today, or it will be better. I hope it will be better, but 
I am just open to experiment with it, basically. Do you plan to concentrate only on uh, companies, private entities, or also on public entities? So I, I plan to work with communities that are currently existing. So typically they would be, I mean, not necessarily companies, they could be non-profits, they could be co-ops, they could be other forms, legal forms. But it's true that right now, I would be reluctant to get into the public administration hell, which, I mean, also because the pilots that I want to do are with communities that are working and that are mature, and we don't have the big problems of starting up something new and whatever, but a mature uh, community that has processes that are, that are established, let's try to change a small part of it and do a pilot instead of with something new, some random experimentation or whatever. So it's true that there is a lot of interest from the public administrations to use blockchains, the same as there are a lot of interest from the banks, but I'm just not that interested. I mean, I'm not strongly against if you find a good use case. It's just that today the use cases that they are talking, for example, identity or stuff like that, is not so much, it doesn't fall so much into the core of the collaborative economy. So let me react to something y you said, you know, again, in the context of A, B, and B, sure. right? That you know, uh, one user wants one features from the platform, another from another one, uh, and other features, and it's understandable. Everybody has preferences. Even, even now, uh, as a user of A, B, and B, you can go to A, B, and B says, well, I don't like it. Uh, I want credit cards used in a different way or, you know, uh, or whatever. Right, and A, B, and B can decide, but you know, it has decision power, and I, I do think they have a decision power for good reasons because they, you know, they own the infrastructure, operate the infrastructure, and that's why decision power comes uh, with them. Right. So the story of collaborative economy: everybody brings in resources and gets a decision power, uh, decision power <coughs> with this, and what was just said about sharing. I can kind of relate it from own research experience. We had a paper in a very different context. It's basically internet transit. Uh, instead of everybody buying internet transit independently, you can form a group and buy it as a group, use economies of scale to reduce overall cost and distribute savings among individual partners. And when we were submitting this journal version of the work, uh, the reviewer said, well, there is nothing new here. So there is uh, some company in Northern California that, you know, did something similar like this. And uh, so we decided to investigate, contacted this guy uh, who established the company a long time ago and said, well, essentially what happened, it was internet uh, connectivity was so expensive at that time. Uh, basically, uh, I had a couple of friends and we said, well, if we buy just this internet connection and <laughs> share the cost, and that'll be uh, a good thing. Uh, but essentially, when the fourth guy came, he became a customer. <laughs> so that for me, it's a sh uh, the story of sharing. Mm -hmm. On small scale, it works. But uh, at some point, uh, the group becomes too heterogeneous, uh, and essentially, uh, some people do a service, become providers, uh, like they became the first internet, tra uh, internet transit provider. Right, and others are customers. <coughs> so it's, it seems to be a common pattern that you know, emerges in economic relations uh, relationship everywhere. So I don't know whether it's subject for your social research or not, but it seems to be something deep into humans. So if they had had a blockchain by then, imagine that these three people that started, they didn't want to lose, uh, like to abandon their jobs and start a business, start up and start providing services. It, I'm sure that a lot of time this happens, right? A group of people are sharing, others want to join and it's like, no, we don't want to provide the service. We don't want, you know, it's a hassle or whatever. And they do not provide the service. Others, it's true that would provide a service and be become the providers having, again, the concentrated power over all their customers. If with a blockchain, these people could create a, DA, a DAO, write the rules of the sharing, deploy it, and forget about it. And 
people will join and become customers not of a provider but of a software and they will be able to share with the rules established by the DAO if they want to build a business on top of that they can they can provide extensions maintenance new versions um, uh, insurances they could provide ad additional services that the DAO itself is not providing but others could fork it provide new services and you would have an ecosystem of new kind of sharing are controlled by these rules i think but the bottom line i think it's all boils down what people want to do sure of course right? definitely <laughs> and the question what no no would like because many of them will prefer to make take profits right and uh, yeah. sure and the you, you same example with the law right with the two version of uh, uh, Ethereum uh, with, a, I don't know, this 50 million, sorry, right? So essentially, when people get upset, right, they find a way to uh, impose a law on the code. So essentially, a uh, code is just um, automatic, easy way to represent human wishes. But uh, after all, the humans at the end, again, the whole, this Bitcoin ecosystem exists just because big entities in the world who can make impact, they tolerate them, right? Or, or big enough group of people who can affect these decisions, right? Because sure, sure. It's just that this is trying to propose a new f field where we can build alternatives to the things that we are seeing in reality. So for example, Aragon, it's a uh, initiative in the ecosystem that tries to provide digital jurisdictions where you would have conflict mm -hmm. resolution and law within digital uh, jurisdictions of DAOs. So this DAO would comply with this digital jurisdiction, which guarantees to its users these rights or this conflict resolution or with this whatever, these systems. And then when the 50 million hack happens, you have somewhere to complain. Otherwise you have, you have to rely to the legal system today. Okay, we had the... Uh, okay. Question. Well, basically we, are, basically we are speaking about uh, public blockchain. What do you think about permissionless blockchain or consortium with maybe proof of authority algorithm? So, I'm much more invested in the public blockchains than in the permission blockchains because in the end you can even it's difficult to call them blockchains <laughs> when i mean if it's not public then you don't the, who's mining it's just relying on the some actors that are mining right because it's not a pub it's not a public ecosystem where anyone is seeing the transactions and can join and whatever so then you have a dependency you don't have a decentralized ecosystem anymore then you also don't have the transparency or at least it's a limited transparency right only for the actors that can join also it's not a community anymore because it's a club so then it's losing a lot of the f beautiful features that we were seeing here and then i'm not that interested I mean, although it's true that it has some beauty there because it basically enables ways of interoperability among actors that don't trust each other, which is nice. It, and it facilitates cooperation among actors that don't, don't trust each other. Like that's why black bo banks are so interested in that. And yet it's not my thing, I think. <laughs> I mean, it's good, it's legit. But it's just I'm not that interested in that part. Okay, I think we are out of our slot, even though I know the talk itself was shorter uh, than usually, but the discussion was much longer. So I think. Uh, uh, so let's um, uh, let's uh, try to conclude here. And I think if you are interested, and um, I know I think Samir is available. And the great thing about it, he's here in town in Madrid, so yeah, <laughs> it should be easier to reach out he even uh. physically in person. Um, so let's uh, thank Samir again and thank you all for coming.